A day after a holiday focused on feasting, let's talk about the areas of our city where it's tough to get fresh food and what we might be able to do to change that. We've admitted we hold Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert to a lower standard than other elected Republicans and Democrats in Colorado. So we should tell you about her latest Islamophobic attack on a fellow Congresswoman. We're headed into one of the busiest shopping weekends of the year as small businesses try to recover, the challenges keep piling up. Because we uh, frankly can't afford to get sick in a small business because you don't have a crew. Now that we're all back together for the holidays, there are bound to be more mistakes. So let's talk about your holiday fails. And what started as a gift for her kids has turned into a mission to help other people's kids still growing strong after 40 years. Grab some leftovers, head to the TV. I'm Steve Steger in for Kyle. This is next. Chances are your belly is still recovering from all that goodness you ate yesterday. The last thing you want to hear about is something healthy. But let's talk about healthy food and the lack of access to it in some parts of our city. It can lead to bigger health disparities, which can continue a cycle of inequities in our communities. Victoria De Leon looks at the economic reasons food deserts exist and what can be done about that. This map from the city of Denver highlights food deserts across the city. The darker the color, the higher percentage of people not within a 10-minute walk to the grocery store. The U.S. Department of Agriculture considers an area to be a food desert if at least 500 people, or 33% of the population, live more than a mile away from a supermarket or large grocery store. You know, there's smaller grocery stores, I think, but they tend to not, you know, not serve the fresh food. And so, unfortunately, people in those areas end up paying really high prices because they're forced to shop at these convenience stores and these small format stores. Darren Dubersmith is a senior lecturer with MSU Denver's College of Business. He says food deserts all come down to money. A store would open up a store in a location if they thought they could turn a profit. It's not unusual for grocery stores to operate with very thin profit margins, which is why Dubersmith says population size in communities and consumer volume also plays a role in where chain grocery stores decide where to open up a location. That's where he says tax incentives from federal and state governments could offer a solution. In, in the same way that car companies get tax credits to produce green vehicles, King Supers and Safeway and these businesses could be subsidized by the set, uh, state and federal government to produce uh, essentially money losing grocery stores in these food deserts. So what's really interesting is the Sun Valley neighborhood was once considered a food desert. Then earlier this year, about a month ago, maybe a publicly funded grocery store opened up through a partnership between the Denver Housing Authority and the city. So, Steve, it seems like Denver is starting to make some progress in that direction. Yeah. And, and you know, it seems so easy. You just say, put more money into this problem. It's tricky to try to convince people to do that. Right, exactly. It's tricky to convince people that, hey, your taxes might go up to put grocery stores in this area where they really need it. And that's where you see a lot of nonprofits come into play. You see these mobile food pantries, but those seem kind of like Band-Aid solutions. It's good to talk about solutions, though. It's nice to hear about that. Victoria De Leon, thank you. Appreciate it. This weekend is big time for a lot of small business owners in Colorado. Businesses hurt by the pandemic are hoping to make up for some of the losses over the coming weeks. But businesses in the metro area have yet another pandemic hurdle to deal with as the unvaccinated prolong this pandemic. A new mask mandate that just kicked in a few days ago. In four blocks of this stretch of Broadway, we have at least 26 women-owned businesses. Hi. How are y'all doing? We're really invested in this neighborhood. Hi, everybody. Hi I am the founder and owner of Hope Tank. We've been wearing masks the whole time. Have y'all been in with us before? Our staff maintained masks the whole time, just, you know, because we uh, frankly can't afford to get sick in a small business because you don't have a crew. Thank you. Yeah. We don't get a lot of pushback these days. I think. Most folks understand that it's to, you know, help us stay open. We have to follow the rules. Since we aren't doing this in Texas, it was a shock at first, but then I was like, wow, they care. So yeah, we're gonna wear our mask. I mean, it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, whatever it takes to keep everybody safe. Ironically, the, the folks who are vaccinated tend to be the most, um, give us the most pushback because they're a little indignant about it. And, um, you know, we're all vaxxed, but we don't think that's anybody's business, <laughs> frankly. like. We don't have capacity to check people's um, vaccination status, and we feel like that's kind of invasive. Um, so we'd prefer to just sort of say, like we, our sign says, you know, mass required, 
please don't make it weird because it's an uncomfortable situation for everybody. Um, and so we're just trying to use some humor um, to, to lessen some of that pushback. We have had our share of people not loving the requirement. Um, but again, I think, you know, the folks who support us and the folks who support small businesses generally have no problem with it. Don't make it weird. We appreciate the folks at Hope Tank for sharing their stories through the lens of photojournalist Tom Cole. Now, Boulder County Health wants people living there to hashtag step up in doing their part against COVID-19. That includes wearing a mask, though they are sending out some pretty mixed messages about it with at least one ad. Dick was driving on Baseline Road on Wednesday when he spotted this ad, the Step Up Boulder County campaign on the back of a bus. It reads, wear your mask, keep your distance, don't gather. The man featured in the ad, though, curiously is not wearing a mask. The county has had a mask mandate in place since the beginning of September, one of the first counties in the metro area to do it. Everyone over the age of two is required to wear one in indoor public spaces, though like Denver, Boulder County, businesses can apply to opt out for a program where they can require proof of vaccination instead. Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert is apologizing now for doubling down on her bigoted anti-Muslim rhetoric following a, for, to a fellow member of Congress. Boebert was caught on tape at a public event suggesting that Minnesota Democrat Ilhan Omar could be a suicide bomber at the U.S. Capitol. The website Patriot Takes says that this was recorded at an event in Pueblo on Saturday. And I see a Capitol Police officer running hurriedly to the elevator. I see fret all over his face and he's reaching and I'm like, what? I can't, the door's shutting. Like, I can't, I can't open it. Like, what's happening? I look to my left and there she is, oh. Ilhan Omar. Oops. And I said, well, she doesn't have a backpack. We should be fine. Oh. <laughs> Laughs in the room make it even worse. Congresswoman Omar responded to that video in a tweet last night, said this whole story was made up and that Boebert typically looks down when she sees her at the Capitol. Boebert tweeted this morning that she apologizes to, quote, anyone in the Muslim community she offended and said that she's reached out to Omar's office. Colorado's first elected Muslim lawmaker, Democratic State Representative Iman Judah, says Boebert's comments dig deeper than just politics. Stereotypes like these uh, often push that agenda of Islamophobia and continue to marginalize groups that are already uh, underrepresented in government, uh, both state and nationally. The reality is, is that Muslims all around the state and really all over the nation have been faced with Islamophobia for decades. And it was only compounded during the Trump administration. And now that we are kind of turning a new page, Muslims are really have to, having to make up for lost time and really having to rebuild those bridges. Now, this afternoon, that same website, Patriot Takes, posted another video from the same event where Boebert launched a homophobic attack against Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Boebert has yet to address those comments, and we've told you we tend to hold Boebert to a lower standard than elected officials in this state because, her, because of her propensity to say ugly things for attention and for fundraising. And we've pointed out that that's unfair to other elected Republicans and Democrats in Colorado who don't say this stuff on a regular basis. We're still working through how to best manage all of that, and we figured we should share all of this with you. Well, we hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving full of family time and good food. Each person of every background has certain foods that define their holidays. And this week's Word of Thanks recipient helps provide holiday meals to families in need. And not just the food they need, but the food they actually want. Here's Kyle with an update on your fundraising progress so far. Hey, everybody. So what was it, like a year and a half ago, I was sitting here. Remember this place? You were sitting there. And we started out on this project to see if pooling our $5 contributions for nonprofits in Colorado might make a big difference if a whole lot of people did it all at once. And the night before Thanksgiving, your word of thanks donations passed the $5 million mark. 
We're going to find an appropriate time to celebrate that in the near future, but we've got some work to do this week. We're raising money for Food Bank of the Rockies to cover the holiday grocery bills of our neighbors. This is pretty simple stuff. If you've ever wanted to pay for the groceries of the person ahead of you in line, or to look across the diner and say that you'll pick up somebody else's meal because you think you might be a little bit more fortunate than they are, well, this is your opportunity. Food Bank of the Rockies does that 365 days a year, but it's especially important during the holidays. So scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in giving to Food Bank of the Rockies. Since Wednesday night, you have raised $50,000 to cover the grocery bills at holiday time for our neighbors in Colorado. As always, thank you. Every year for almost four decades, she's been providing some holiday cheer to children she's never even met, one stitch at a time. The turkey is still digesting, but it's not too early to look ahead. Christmas is alive. Thanksgiving is no more. It's the season of traditions. Our favorite one is next. We have a holiday tradition around here. We love to laugh at some of your biggest holiday fails. Now, we are not laughing at you. We are definitely laughing with you. You've already shared some great ones that we think the whole group needs to hear about. Like Brian, he says he and his wife are making dinner for their first Christmas together in their tiny apartment back before they were married. Brian says that he's a good cook, though he wasn't used to using that tiny oven. So he set the turkey on fire. Who among us hasn't done that? Well, I guess I haven't. But uh, Suzanne says one year she was in charge of the mashed potatoes, didn't realize it was too late, that she didn't have any milk in the house, just lactate. So she says in the end it tasted more like moose potatoes. And uh, we could all take a moment to appreciate Gracie, a very good girl who might have done something bad, though you cannot prove that to us, despite this photo evidence Kara took of Gracie climbing on the table to eat the turkey. We have all had holiday fails, so we want to see yours. Email your stories to next at 9news.com or get our attention on Twitter with the hashtag HeyNext. Bonus points if you have visual documentation of said fail. A beautiful end to the week with temperatures soaring into the upper 60s this afternoon. A far cry from what should be our typical high of 49 and pretty close to that record of 74. Tonight, the sun has set. We are looking at some clear skies out there, but clouds on the move. They're going to be rolling in late tonight across much of the Denver metro area ahead of this storm and that cold front. The cold front will push through, but unfortunately, a lot of the rain, the snow that we desperately need, that stays well to our north. Overnight lows staying in the 20s and 30s here in the metro area with 20s way up high. Here comes the front. It swings right on in. It will drop our daytime highs just a bit tomorrow, but it won't bring us any rain, no snow, only a trace. That's all we have seen here in Denver. By the end of the month, we should be a little closer to a foot. 50s on deck for us tomorrow. Back to the 60s early next week. And then look at that. Hopefully a little snow by next Friday. Hopefully. The holidays are all about traditions. By far, our favorite tradition is sharing your good news here on Fridays. We've been doing that for 274 Fridays now. And for the 275th edition, our Mike Grady headed to Union Station to talk to some of our fellow Coloradans who were enjoying their long holiday weekend. Christmas is alive. Thanksgiving is no more. <laughs> <laughs> it is Good News Friday. My good news is I'm very excited to be here with my sister and my good friend eating lunch and getting over my fear of being on TV. <laughs> my good news is an immersive art installation that I did is opening next weekend on December 4th. I'm going to be uh, at Crested Butte visiting some friends. We're all in di three different states um, mm -hmm. and decided that we wanted to do a trip and spend Thanksgiving together. Had some issues with flights, missing flights. So we were able to scramble together a flight for her to get to Denver. She's not shy, <laughs> except for in front of a camera. <laughs> the people inside are the final piece. So finally get to see what they think. I don't have a family here, so it's always good to have some close friends and yeah, be there with them. Uh, why is it good to kind of push yourself outside your comfort zone? That's where the growth happens. It's so important. That's where the growth happens. Experiencing new things with the people you love the most. Like, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Just really happy right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very happy yeah. to be here. It's great news. <laughs> 
She's always got something going on. She's not good at just sitting and not doing much of anything. Free time is a precious commodity. A Colorado woman has been using hers to put her fingers to work every holiday season so she can spread a little love and cheer to kids in need. We'll meet her next. Jean Perry is 95 years old and still sewing. Started almost 40 years ago as something nice she did for her little kids. She still does it today, just for other people's children. Every year she makes dozens of Christmas stockings and donates them to kids on Native American reservations or children who are stuck in hospitals during the holidays. She and her daughter talk to our foster gains about their selfless holiday tradition. You look beautiful, Mom. Uh, you look beautiful. I am. Since probably 1982, she's been making stockings. I am sewing sequins and beads. She started by making them for all her children. 66 years I've been going through this. <laughs> I'm not complaining. And she got me into it, so I'm doing it now, too. There's all kind of needles here. Well, though, let's just find one that works. She's um, currently making 40 of those, of which these will all go to actually a school that's on an Indian reservation. First grade. First grade students. No, it takes a while to do them. <laughs> But she starts in the summertime for I sure. start in the summertime, four to five hours a day, seven days a week. If you could look at the detailed work on them, you could understand why it takes so long. They wouldn't have these if it wasn't for something like what she's doing for these children. Well, there are times I sit and cry when I see these kids don't have anything. But if only people would realize what these poor children are going through and help. Don't stick yourself. Well, I've done that many times. And I just wish I had time and the means of doing more every year. I don't know what I would do sometimes if I didn't have this project to do. You'd find something to do. You always do. Yeah, I can give you a hard time. <laughs> That's true, too. This year's stockings are going to the St. Joseph's Indian School in Chamberlain, South Dakota. They'll be sending the stockings with gift bags full of candy, coloring books, and crayons. Free bird without the Leonard Skinner. One unique pet gets captured, another avoids becoming Thanksgiving dinner. The most Colorado thing we saw today, plus your feedback about how I enjoy food too much, next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is an Old West Roundup on the Western Slope. A whole posse was needed to wrangle in a loose emu in Montrose. The Montrose County Sheriff's Office first heard of the emu on the run on Monday. Together with the owner, animal control officers, and a waste management employee, they captured the bird. Probably helped that emus can't fly because their flat breastbones lack the keel that anchors the strong pectoral muscles requ required for flight. That's according to National Geographic. Uh, this turkey escaped someone's dinner plate. Chris spotted the lucky bird walking around 104th and Pecos in North Glen. Says it didn't seem frightened by people and nearby cars, so it seems pretty confident with its newfound freedom. Send us bird stuff to next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. Your feedback now, D says, and I'm sorry if you were offended is not a real apology. Don't give her credit for that. Well, D, we wanted to acknowledge that Lauren Boebert apologized because we're pretty sure it's one of the first times we've heard that. And Robin writes in, Steve, I'm right there with you. I gained 20 pounds during COVID. Please unbutton your jacket. Boom. 